Hi, Working Preachers. This is Matt Skinner. We're getting close to the end of our fundraising campaign, but you still have time to make a difference for working preachers in 200 countries and territories around the globe. Thanks to two anonymous longtime Luther Seminary donors with a passion for preaching and for supporting new preachers, we have a matching gift available. As soon as we raise $25,000 toward this fall campaign, a $10,000 matching gift will be unlocked. Gifts of any size will make a tremendous difference. We know you rely on the resources that Working Preacher provides, so we're asking for your help now to keep Working Preacher thriving and improving. Your support helps ensure that Working Preacher remains free and available to all, no matter where they are. You can make a one-time gift or a monthly gift securely online at workingpreacher.org slash donate. Thank you for supporting this vital ministry. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This is the podcast for the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on November 3rd, 2024. And uh, if you are looking for uh, the All Saints uh, podcast, that is a separate podcast. But the readings for the 24th Sunday after Pentecost are Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Uh, we have an alternative uh, semi-continuous reading from Ruth, chapter 1, 1 through 18. Our psalm is, chap- is Psalm 119, only verses 1 through 8, though. And then uh, our uh, New Testament reading is Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14. And then our gospel is the uh, gospel of Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. And um, I should mention that um, we are, uh, this uh, is uh, shortly before um, For those of us in the United States, uh, uh, a little election that's going on. Um, But you should know we are recording this several weeks in advance. So um, we have no idea what's going on. Uh, And as as Matt said, (laughs) um, we're sure it's exciting. (laughs) But um, uh, so if you're if you're wondering why we aren't addressing something, uh, it's because uh, we don't know. It hasn't happened yet. Um, but um, uh, uh, we we're we're glad to be here with you uh, uh, yet again as we prepare for uh, preaching uh, on November third. I want to give advice to my future self during election week, and that's ooh, get a good ooh. night's sleep. Mm. Just go to bed. Yeah, it's probably good that we're not recording these right around then because I don't think we could concentrate. <laughs> I know I couldn't. I'd be like, ah, I don't. I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so. Uh, we'll do the same thing for the World Series, though, right? It is- yeah, we do. We do. Oh. <laughs> You're getting excited, Caroline? All right. Yeah. So, Mark, 12. Socks are out. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. They, they I don't know who's out. in, who's they out. out of, All I know is that the White Sox just made an incredible historic loss. It hasn't been whoever lost in 1962. We just tied with them. I don't know. <laughs> ah. oh. Well, let's talk about, you know, greatness then. And, uh, you know, we've we've had conversations in Mark about what greatness is and who gets to sit by Jesus. And now it's which commandment is the first of all, which is the best one. I, you know, this is a strangely appropriate text for November 3rd and for starting to sew up the, the, uh, the liturgical year as well. Finally, at the mm-hmm. end of the day, Jesus, what's it all about? Mm-hmm. And he gives a, a an unusually straightforward answer. Unusually yeah. for Mark. <laughs> well, unusual, unusually in general, but that's very true. We're we're coming close to the end of year B. We have this Sunday and two more before we have Christ the King, and then move into a new liturgical season with the year of Luke. And so there is something about these next three weeks, I think that that the preacher is looking backward and saying, what, where have we been through Mark? What do we need to reiterate? What do we need to 
perhaps repeat or to be reminded of as Mark has offered us a, you know, a theological imagination for who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. And here in particular, yeah, you get a pretty straightforward answer. And what I also like about this passage is that, well, I don't know if I like, well, yeah, well, I like the straightforwardness. How about that? But the other thing I like about that is that the scribe is then, then paraphrases it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're right, teacher, you, the, and uh, that he is the one besides him, there is no other, and to love him with all our heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. There's this kind of a this much more than important than the whole bird offering. So he's taking it and kind of reworking it in his own language and, uh, or his own, you know, understanding as he's trying to make, make sense of this and how he's wording it. And that would be my first homiletical entry into this week is how would you paraphrase this? The, these, this first commandment and the second, you love your neighbor as yourself. What is, what words would you give to that? How would you, how would you, how would you describe that? Uh, what does that, what does that look like in your life? So that one direction would be to, uh, to invite people to into that, that paraphrase activity or to language it in the relanguage it in their language or the, in their vernacular or how would they summarize it uh, in such a way that uh, that is something that they could remember and something that they could hold on to I think I'll take a, a I'll lean in uh, to your um, uh, how would you summarize it uh, Caroline and say uh, for me uh, this is, you know, the Reader's Digest verse of uh, version uh, of all of the commandments. That that what they are is, uh, in the words of Har- uh, Stanley Harwas and Will Willimon, uh, in the Truth About God, um, they they say the Ten Commandments is is how we worship God, how we um, live. That in a way that only makes sense if God exists. So ultimately, it's about God. And when we when we read this in that way, it's not parsing it out to to um, you know don't keep you you can keep this rule but don't keep that rule or you can keep this rule but you can miss this one. You can do you can skip seven but make sure you keep nine. Um, but instead, it's the whole of the Ten Commandments is actually how we serve God. And in serving God, what we are doing is loving one another. And um, so, again, leaning on Harwas and Willimon, because I kind of learned how to look at these Ten Commandments through, through their teaching, is this is simple, it's terse, it's to the point, but it is in no way simple. Um, it's almost as if this question is, okay, wh- wh- which one can't we put aside? Uh, wh- what's the primary one? Uh, as you led, Matt, what's the greatest one? And Jesus's response is, well, that's not so easy because it's all or none here. And then when in his paraphrase, the scribe actually reiterates that, it's then that Jesus responds, okay, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And in that, at least as it's recorded here, he had shown himself not to be one that's to be trifled with, because that's what led to this, right? He's been putting every, shutting everyone up, and they wanted to see what they would do. And once again, oh, okay, I'm not going to stand. You got a question? I don't have one. Yeah, it's kind of funny that this ends with after that, no one dared to ask him any question, <laughs> like whatever this looks like to everybody on the outside. What's interesting is that here's somebody who appears to ask in good faith. This is after mm-hmm. yeah. he's had a lot of questions. They've been a lot of, of entrapment kinds of questions. So here's that. And then Jesus actually answers quite positively. This is really important for us to remember that here's a good scribe. Here's a scribe who gets it. Um, yes. Next week, we're going to read some very, very harsh words that Jesus will direct towards scribes. Yeah. 
Uh, and so just make a note of this so that next week you don't think, well, all the scribes were, were miserable. Um, I just, I imagine that this passage is a snippet of what a lot of his conversations were like with people about, about law, about what's central, about other scriptures that, that tie into it. And this is how religious people talk to each other. And it's, <laughs> it's getting closer to the truth, right? And like you said, Caroline, the rewording it, it's a, there's a kind of scaffolding going on here. Mm -hmm. And like you said, Joy, the harder part is of course, living this out, right? Easy to talk about it and fight mm -hmm. about it, and, you know, diagram it. How do you actually live it? But I, I, I would really urge preachers, if you've been slogging through Mark through this year, don't let this go by too quickly. I mean, to talk about this is a Jesus who's really hard to get to know throughout this gospel. And most people seem to miss everything. And here he's like, there's nothing here that you haven't heard before, folks. I got all my best ideas from Judaism and I'm going to keep reiterating them. And, you know, he's on his way to the cross, of course, and that's its own crisis. But mm -hmm. at the heart of who he is and what he's about, it's this ministry of love of God and love of neighbor. And I, that's, a, that's an important connection there, too, is that Jesus' response takes us really back to how Jesus' first words in the gospel, repent mm -hmm. uh, and believe for the, you know, the kingdom of God has come near. And so that, that perspective of what God's kingdom looks like is then made pretty clear here. This is, this is what, this is, you're, we're getting close to being able to see or to live out or to practice what the kingdom of God looks like when we love, when we love God with all of our soul and mind and heart and love our neighbor as ourselves. So you want an answer of what, you know, what am I supposed to, how do I know that the kingdom of God has come near? How do I know what the kingdom of God looks like? What is it, what is it about? Well, here it is. And so I think also to make that connection back to what has Jesus been trying to show all along in the, in the first place uh, that this is, this is what it looks like. And, and again, I would, I would reiterate the capacity for us to narrate that in our own understanding of what that means is like, like you said, a scaffolding to the step of, okay, well then what does that actually look like in practice? Uh, but we have to have we have to have a process of interpretation of meaning, then to be able to act it out, and that's in part what the I don't want to go too quickly if we're not ready, but that's in part what the commentary I think helps us with with Deuteronomy. I, I was is, thinking that yeah is what as the as the commentator asks we might ask ourselves. What practices will keep this central principle on our hands, foreheads, mm -hmm. gates, and doorposts? That is, that that central mission to love God and love neighbor. Then, what are those practices? And so, to take a to take the listeners through that that claim of Jesus to an interpretation and meaning to what are those what are those practices look like, especially when. Uh, when a lot of what the kingdom of God is supposed to look like from some people looks nothing like this. Mm. So mm. there's a lot of uh, opposing views of what the kingdom of God is supposed to be that, as far as I can tell, looks nothing, like, nothing. like what Jesus is saying. Exactly. And so I think em empowering people or coming alongside listeners and helping them articulate that is they're not just quoting nice quote to put on a plaque. It's uh, what is it? What is it actually going to look like? Yeah. If we stay with uh, Deuteronomy, if you're fine with that, um, reading the hero Israel and, uh, you know, recite these um, talk about them, write them down, uh, bind them as a sign, fix them. Don't miss the context of verse uh, uh, one, uh, that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe. So this is, this is coming back uh, to, this isn't just belief. 
This is behavior. This isn't just remember. This is to enact. Um, and as I said uh, before, it's simple, but it is not easy. And um, the idea that all we have to do is know it um, misses the fact that what Israel is called to is to embody it. And um, that Jesus, going back to, to Mark, that Jesus has embodied it, that Jesus has shown us what it truly means to love our neighbor, uh, what it truly means to walk uh, uh, along with others where we are um, uh, not coveting what they have, uh, that we are loving, honoring, serving, worshiping God, uh, that we are living in a way that makes God known, not just what is the benefit for me, oh, uh, that I might multiply greatly in, in a land of flowing with milk and honey. What is this all about? This is always about pointing to the God of Israel, the God made known in Jesus. And so it's it's not just a matter of belief. It, it's definitely about behavior that causes people to ask, why do you do that? And then you can say, well, here's why. I just want to add, uh, I think the commentary by Dave Garber is great on Deuteronomy 6, and the, make sure people read that, especially the Alan Mintz material about what, what does the oneness of God mean? The Shema can sound odd in the ears of people who are are, are entirely too comfortable with monotheism <laughs> and <laughs> to get a sense of what does it mean to be introduced to the God who took you out of servitude in Egypt, I think is really important. And then the way that uh, Garber as well situates all of this um, just prior to the exodus, uh, just prior to the conquest as well and the problematic aspects mm -hmm. uh, of, of all of that. So it's um, it's really important to think about how we're not just talking about like right religious belief, orthodoxy, or understanding of who God is, but this idea of God is that, that ultimate ground of meaning, uh, to quote from Mintz, and that anything else, therefore, isn't just an error hmm. or bad for you. It's settling for too little mm -hmm. in life. Which I think that's where the psalm could be really helpful. I would bring in the psalm in, if you were going in this direction. And the way in which, you know, walk in the law of the Lord, keep his decrees, de decrees seek him with their whole heart, walk in his ways, observe statutes, uh, learn righteous ordinances. I mean, that's, that's, and that, and it, and it's a claim of happy or blessed are those who, right. Who this is, this is part of, this is part of the blessing of God is that, that yes. those ordinances and those commandments that we keep mean a connect, a, a connectivity with God. Uh, and then of course with neighbor. And so uh, the result of that is blessedness and happiness. That's what I would do with the psalm this week. Yeah, so this is just the first eight verses of what the longest psalm. Mm -hmm. um, and that entire psalm is celebrating the law. Um, but that blessedness that you're talking about, Caroline, is a result of actions. It, it, you know, it's walking in this way. Uh, it's, it's living uh, a life that is directed by this. Uh, so yeah, I love that way of including the psalm. Uh, this is a perfect psalm for this. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna reference uh, Harawas and Willimon again, um, uh, again from uh, the Truth About God, uh, the Ten Commandments in a Christian Life, where they say um, this is a means of living in a world out of our control. So th th this 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 idea of these commandments is not to be in control. It's a way of living in a world that we do not control. And um, if you let me, I'm going to get what sounds pretty political just for a moment. Um, but they wrote this book uh, back, uh, I think, in the 90s. And um, 
Yeah, I think, I think it's that old. Uh, and they talk about placing the commandments on the wall of a U.S. courtroom. So I'm currently down in Alabama. It was here that that happened, except for when I say that, it sounds like I'm talking about the laws that are being written right now in 2024. And I bring that up not to be provocative. I bring that up to remind us that human behavior is the same over and over again. The ways in which we say the right things but don't always live them out. And what these commands are about, what this, what these 10 words are about is living as if God's promises are true in a world that doesn't get it. So we're not going to advocate adding verses to the psalm reading? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> it's a long psalm, Matt. <laughs> It is. It's a little repetitive, too, if I can be perfectly honest. But uh, We've got Ruth, and uh, only two Sundays devoted to Ruth, which is a shame. But you know what? Yeah. It is a month that has four Sundays. You could always um, hijack November and do four Sundays on Ruth, one Sunday for each chapter. You would have to you know, do something different with all saints. You would have to do something different with Reign of Christ. But... Um, what an important story for people to know, to know where it fits in the canon and where in the bigger story and what it's pushing back against, but also uh, a story about welcome and about the possibility of learning a divine virtue from a stranger from another place who isn't supposed to know it like you do. Yeah, yeah. So if you choose to hijack it, as uh, as, as as Matt has suggested, uh, so the timing for Ruth, if we pay attention, it's this is during the Judges. And so we have the book of Judges, which is just horror after horror after horror. It's um, the time before the kings and Israel is doing what is right in their own eyes. And then here we have this story, like you said, Matt, of the demonstration of a life where God reigns. I'm, I'm suggesting the Christ the King Sunday to work around this portion of the text if you hijack the month. Um, it begins in the setting of grief, these women grieving the loss of their sons and their spouses, and uh, the reality of that grief, which we've already talked about, and then to be able to move forward um, with what does it mean to truly trust in the embodied life, the promises of God. And so everything that the other texts push is actually in this story of Ruth. Um, so the hijack wouldn't necessarily change the theme. It would just change the text out of which we're preaching these themes. Well, it's so rare, <laughs> as we know in Scripture, to have uh, a passage, let alone a book, that focuses on uh, the dynamic, this dynamic relationship between Naomi and her daughters-in-law, and uh, and the way that this story is told is just how much of how much of it narrates just the back and forth and the the reality of of what. Naomi experiences, and then and then Ruth and Orpa and their um, choices of survival uh, in the midst of layers and layers of 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 really um, mm, yeah layers of all kinds of loss, uh, mm -hmm. and that there's no there's I I love it, like particularly one through eighteen that there's you know, it, it could be so much shorter, right? It could be just this like, you know, and so it makes you just think about the way in which we get a glimpse into how, um, how people are navigating these relationships, but also uh, through the, through the presence of what is God up to in this? Mm -hmm. um, what do we, how do we see Naomi at work here? Or it, 
that just trying to interpret, she's really doing theology here. She's really yeah, trying to figure out like, yeah, how is God, how is God working here? How do I respond to that? What do I do in this situation? And so I like, I love that about one of the things I love about this book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if um, if listeners have not worked through Ruth before, there's, uh, you know, I, I still love Catherine Sackenfeld's commentary, which is probably like 30 years old right now, but uh, really helps focus on chesed, you know, the loving kindness, which is an important theme in the book, which which Ruth models to Naomi or just offers to Naomi. But also the ways in which the book is also much more Naomi's book than Ruth's book in terms of how it's told and absolutely how Naomi's arc changes in this. It will end with her being, you know, nurse to her grandson. And um it just expands a notion of family. It expands a notion of nationhood, expands a notion of like who is my neighbor. I mean it's makes it so timeless and, and perhaps especially uh, for this November in all sorts of ways. But like you said, you know, where is God in this? And this is one of these books where God is not a very active character. Occasionally there'll be some things, but you know, God doesn't show up and speak. There's no, no vision, no revelatory moment or something like that. But it's showing in this kind of, you know, odd, I don't want to use the word simple. That's not quite right. But very pastoral in the sense of, you know, outdoorsy, normal folk, right? Who are able to live in harmony despite all of the difficulty and all of the threat in the natural world in legal terms and borders. Um, and in doing so, they model something of what divine faithfulness and loving kindness looks like. So, you know, Matt, you as you said Hebrews. that. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Dylan, I was going to say, as you say that, I caught where Caroline was saying uh, Naomi's doing theology and kind of underscored that. Um, the incarnation is basically Jesus pointing clearly to God. So we, t- so I often say the God made known in Jesus, and the God of Israel is made known to these Moabite women because of their mother-in-law, and um, Ruth uh, commits herself to this God, in many ways, we have the embodied um, um, living of the commandments that we were talking about earlier happening right now in Naomi and the witness to God that's very similar to what we have in the gospel narratives. God only shows up a couple of times. It's Jesus pointing. Um, I, I hadn't noticed that before, Matt, but uh, I, I, I've been playing with uh, the story of Ruth because of the timing of Judges is kind of the antithesis of what we get from, you know, the, um, the, the tribes of Israel. Uh, but wow, to focus on God's presence in the person of Naomi by the witness of Naomi makes this yet another powerful uh, book not to be overlooked. Yeah, I mean, I think certain biblical texts uh, unduly influence our understanding of what God's presence is supposed to look like, as if it's always about certainty, as if it's always something obvious or a big splash, or you know, God's doing something that has to be new or has to be dramatic. And uh, uh, and texts like this say that there's other ways in which God shows up. We um, outdoorsy. Our vision is too narrow in in a lot of churches, in my experience. But and yeah, no, so no, now he doesn't Hebrews? have any. Yeah. Oh, well, and Naomi, no, and Naomi doesn't have any doubt that her God is with her. None at all. Wherever she is. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're moving along through Hebrews and I think I've lost That's not track. How I'd of- put it. Are we really moving along or are we just kind of <laughs> like. <laughs> I've lost track of, of how many we are in Hebrews. But I do like here, I mean, we've got, again, we've, yeah, we have some repetitive, there's a repetitive nature to Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hebrews. Uh, But the, I mean, this reference to dead works Mm. is, uh, for me, very rhetorically curious 
I mean, obviously, you have to put it in the context of the larger, uh, larger Hebrew, uh, in the larger context of Hebrews. But you know, literally, these these necron argon—that's the singular dead work. Uh, it would be something I would maybe look at, um, particularly already in our conversation of how it's one thing to name the commandment that is most important. It's another thing to say, what is it going to look like? And, uh, and so not embodying it and not doing it would be an example of a dead work as far as I'm concerned. I would, I don't know if I talked about this in this current run of Hebrews, but it's, okay. um, you know, this is a book that I think fuels a lot of, of reflection on a lot of things, but <laughs> on, on sacrifice and sacrificial atonement theories. Sorry, this is going a totally different direction than what you were talking about, Caroline. That's fine. I also Necron one. Aragon is all gold. It's all good stuff. But this is Necron this is Aragon. Direction. You could you could have easy you could go you like say. you could go like <laughs> talk about uh, yeah you could yeah anyway yeah. But I, I don't <laughs> uh, Hebrews never gives us like a, the mechanics of sacrifice. It never kind of explains that Jesus is somehow like a payment or something like that. I think what Hebrews is getting at is it's, it likens Jesus' death to a sacrifice simply because Jesus dies. And what the point is, is it's through the death of Jesus that something dramatically is reoriented. And it's not, so it's it's just not an easy jump to, to a sacrificial atonement. But I guess the point I want to make about that is that we not, that the, that the preacher not lose track of the main point of the book, which is coming up soon, which appears to be about perseverance and sticking with it and not giving up and not settling for too little and continuing to devote yourself to fellowship and continue to devoting yourself in this pursuit toward completion, what we call discipleship, um, because what's happened through the death of Jesus is something that's world changing and, and direction altering uh, forever. So yeah, you're not stuck in a morass of dead works. Um, but, <laughs> but something new has opened up, you know, I mean, there are preachers would take that direction from a pastoral point of view, as opposed to getting too, too deep in some of the sacrificial imagery. It's a metaphor we don't understand because it's been so long since that way of, uh, offering God, uh, worshiping God or offering of making an offering to God has been our practice. And um, we can spend a whole lot of time parsing those words and using, you know, the different theories of atonement, the different uh, doctrines that have been, um, that have been offered over the, over the generations. Um, Or we can pay attention to the fact that, in the familiarity of the first century of rehearsing what they knew and what they knew had also failed them. What they were aware of is that the prophets had gotten upset because they were doing the right rituals and missing it completely. And in the context of the text that we're reading, missing it completely is believing but not behaving. It's knowing the law but not living the law. And so the discipleship angle that you're pointing at, uh, Matt, the uh, where uh, Hebrews is ultimately going from this context of a metaphor that they know to what does the death and resurrection of Jesus mean for the new thing that God is doing becomes, I think, uh, a much um, a much more curious way to explore uh, Hebrews. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.